All right, I'm here, you're here. Let's get started. Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to another exciting afternoon of Organic Chemistry, Chem 170, with your host, me, Dr. White. All right, we got a lot to do. I got some important uh, announcements. One, you should have received an email from me uh, sometime this morning when I sent out for tomorrow's office hour, only for tomorrow, I will be, because of personal reasons, I will have my office hour from eight to nine. If you need me to stay later, I will. And that way, if you have any last minute questions or need any help for test number three, which is this Thursday after class, I'll send out the password. But again, tomorrow, Wednesday, my office hour will start at eight. Also, as I have in that email, the office hour for the rest office hours for the rest of the semester will be five to six. If you need me to stay a little longer, I do. <clears throat> like last night, I think I finished about 6.30, but people needed help. And guess what? I gave it. All right. Let me remind you also this Thursday, we'll have test number three. I'll do it the same way as test one and two. I've already talked about the points breakdown for test number three and what we'll cover. Gesundheit, Matt. <laughs> oh, grandmother trained me well. But anyways, um, that will be Thursday about four o'clock after our class on Thursday, I will send out the email with the password for test three, and you'll get it by, I think at 11 o'clock the next morning, you should have it uploaded to G2L. And as always, let me just remind you, in my world, in my class, there's no such thing as a dumb question. Always feel free to ask questions. All right. What are we going to do today? Well, first of all, I'm going to do the review for test number three. Next, I'm going to finish up the amines problem uh, chapter, and then we'll do the ester problem set. Then we'll move on to new stuff that will be on test four, not test three. So we got a lot to do. I better get started. All right. Let me get this back to the top. Everybody should see test three review on your screen. If not, let me know. Thank you, Joanna. All right, we start out with carboxylic acid. And carboxylic acid, carbonyl, hydrox group, R group. How do you name it? Find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon, name it as an alkane, drop the E and OIC in the word acid. The carbonyl carbon is always one. You don't need a number. Now, there are a couple of common names that you should know. First of all, acetic acid is one R is a methyl group in a carboxylic acid. And if you take 4% acetic acid and 96% approximately water, you have vinegar. Remember, vinegar, anything that has vinegar in it contains acetic acid, such as ketchup, mustard, or that glow-in-the-dark green uh, relish that Chicagoans like Dr. White love. And then if R is an H, it's formic acid, and that's the acid the fire ants use. Now, when R is a benzene ring, the common name was benzoic acid, However, IUPAC and their infinite wisdom, like other things, said, we're not going to change those organic chemists. We'll call it benzoic acid as the IUPAC name, and you should know that. All right, now, carboxylic acid is an acid because it's a proton donor, which is the acidic proton, the hydrogen on the oxygen. If you react it with a base, such as lithium, sodium, or potassium hydroxide, acid base, you get water plus the carboxylate anion. Now, a special base 
that you should know. This is one of the few times where I asked, give all the product or products for a reaction is when you take a carboxylic acid and re react it with sodium bicarbonate baking powder. And when that happens, you get the carboxylate anion, you get water, and you get carbon dioxide, CO2, and the arrow shows you, you get it given off as a gas. Now, if you remember my story about the little rocket ship, and my father taught me how to put vinegar and baking powder in there, close the cap, it builds up pressure from the CO2 and goes pop, like blasting off with your rocket. It was fun. Also, don't forget my father's, uh, I don't know what you'd call it, trick or not trick, part of his recipe for making the best tomato sauce, which has citric acid and a carboxylic acid, baking powder. You neutralize some of the acid, you see bubbles at the top, like a foam. Foam is bubbles. All right, how do you make carboxylic acids? You take a primary alcohol and oxidize it, you get a carboxylic acid. If you take an aldehyde and oxidize it, same thing, you get a carboxylic acid. Now, a really cool way of making a carboxylic acid is taking a Grignard RMGX, where X is chlorine, bromine, or iodine, and reacting with carbon dioxide. Why do I say it's cool? Because when you do it, you use dry ice, which is solid carbon dioxide. Second step, acid and water, and you get a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the R group you started with. You get a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the R group you start with. Uh, quick commercial from Dr. White. The review you're seeing right now is in the lecture section of D2L and Scott the name test number three review. Boy, am I sneaky with my names. All right, back to work. Now, once you have a carboxylic acid, let's talk about an important derivative, something made from a carboxylic acid, and that's an ester. And an ester has carbonyl oxygen with R prime, and the carbonyl carbon has R, ester. How do you name it? Name the R prime as an alkyl group. It would be if you were alone or on something and you put that in front. Next, there are two ways. 2A is the IUPAC way. Pretend R prime is a H, name that carboxylic acid, and then drop the IC in the word acid at the end, add ATE. Now, I had a very inventive student a couple years ago, and he found out for all except when R is a benzene ring, you can do, and I proved he was right, and I thanked him for it, and that's why I remember him, and I don't take credit for this. You take, drop, find the longest chain with the carbonyl carbon, drop the E, and add O-A-T-E. Now, as I promised, for this class, I will not put any alkyl groups on the R group of an ester, even though you handle it the same way. It goes between R prime and the base thing and the carbonyl carbon is number one, but I won't do that. Now, I only ask you to learn one common name of an ester, and that's this one. Nobody calls, <clears throat> excuse me, nobody calls that ethyl acetate. We call it, I mean, nobody calls it ethyl ethanoate. I couldn't even say the IUPAC name, the common name popped in my head so quickly. But anyways, this is ethyl acetate and ethyl is the R prime, and using, instead of ethanoate, use the common name for if R prime is H, acetic acid, drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE, and that's how you get ethyl acetate. And ethyl acetate, just to remind you, is one of the two chemicals used as nail polish remover. Now, when you react the base with a carboxylic acid, you get the carboxylate anion, which I'm showing you on there. How do you name that? IUPAC name M plus 
as the element it comes from. If this were Na plus, it would be sodium, K plus, potassium, uh, Li plus lithium. They have that in front. And then use the same part two, either A2 or B2, for the esters up here for the rest of the day. Now, esters are responsible for the smell of all flowers. When you smell a flower, you're really smelling a ester. And most fruits, not all, but most fruits and vegetables, when you smell and taste that fruit and vegetable, like a banana, you're smelling and tasting an ester. All right, how do you make an ester? Fischer esterification. That is carboxylic acid, alcohol, H plus acid, catalyst, and you make an ester. Replace the OH group with the OR prime from the alcohol. They actually found did studies where the oxygen comes from the alcohol, not this one from the carboxylic acid and this oxygen right here. And you get water, but that's inorganic. Eh. Now, what are reactions of esters? First of all, if you take an ester and add, react it with acid and water, H plus is acid, it's called acid hydrolysis of an ester. You get back the carboxylic acid and the alcohol you would have made, used to make that ester. And remember the oxygen, carbon with the oxygen in R prime is the carbon with the hydroxyl group in the alcohol. Now, if you use a base hydrolysis where MOH is a hydroxide base where M can be lithium, sodium, or potassium, you get back the alcohol you would have used to make that carbon uh, ester, but you get the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester because the carboxylic acid like you get up here immediately reacts with the base to form the carboxylate anion. Now, next I talked about amines and amine derivatives. Amines have these, remember there's three bonds or four bonds to nitrogen, unlike carbon, which is only always four bonds. And here we have primary, secondary, and tertiary amine. And I'll never ask that. How do you name them? I only ask you to learn the common names. Name each R group as the alkyl group it is. And then add the word amine at the end. There's one special amine you should know, aniline. I'll talk more about today or maybe tomorrow. And that's used to make all the dyes for our clothes and other things. Now, something very near and dear to my heart, quaternary ammonium salts. And that has the structure. How do you do the common name? Name each R group as the alkyl group it is. And then add the words ammonium halide at the end. If X is Cl minus, the halide is chlorine. If it's Br minus, it's bromine. And if it's I minus, it's iodine. There are other anions, but I'm not going to teach that in this class. Now, an amine salt is like a quaternary ammonium salt, or a quaternary ammonium salt has four R groups on it. Amine salt has three or less. And here, note R prime and R double prime can be hydrogen, both are one or none. And how do you name amine salts? Same as quaternary ammonium salts, except you don't have four R groups, you have one, two, or three. Now, how do you make an amine? Take ammonia reacted with an alkyl halide, the presence of base, the nitrogen will be bonded to the carbon with the halogen. A lot of you didn't look at where you were placing bonds. It's important. And you get a primary amine. Remember, X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine in these examples. If you take a primary amine and react it with an alkyl halide, you replace one of the hydrogens with, in this case, R prime, and you get a secondary amine. If you take a tertiary, a secondary amine, getting ahead of myself, react it with an alkyl halide base you get a tertiary amine. And now a reaction very near and dear to my heart, 
which I'm probably a world expert in this reaction. I have a number of patents. And if you take a tertiary mean reactor with alcohol halide in the presence of base, you get a quaternary ammonium salt. And remember, quaternary ammonium salts can be used as fabric softener, which I use all the time. And it can be used, certain quaternary ammonium salts are outstanding antimicrobial compounds that kill microbes and other things. And if you look on the list, some of them are even used to kill COVID-19 on surfaces. Quaternary ammonium salts are amazing compounds. Now, another really great way to make a primary amine is take a nitrile carbon nitrogen triple bond reacted with excess hydrogen. That means you have all the hydrogen in the world. Anything hydrogen can react with a catalyst and catalyst can be nickel, platinum, or palladium. to break the two pi bonds of the triple bond to carbon nitrogen. When you do that, each one gets two hydrogens. You can write it this way, or you can write it this way. Now, amines are bases. That means they accept the proton. And if you take an amine, react it with an acid in the presence, uh, well, with an acid. And for this class, I'm going to stick to the hydrohalogen acids or HX. X can be chlorine, bromine, or iodine, and you form an amine salt. Now remember here, our prime and our double prime can be hydrogen, so this could be a primary, secondary, or tertiary amine. Quaternary ammonium salts do not react with acid, but I have never and will never write a question on a test where I ask you give the product or products, and the answer will be no reaction. That will never happen on my test or final. All right, next I talked about a derivative, something made from carboxylic acid and amines, and that's an amide. An amide has this functionality or structure, carbonyl with a nitrogen. On the carbonyl carbon, you have carbons, R. On the nitrogens, you have R prime and R double prime. And it turns out R prime and R double prime, one or both, can be hydrogen. How do you make a amide? Take a carboxylic acid, react it with either ammonia or an amine. Notice our prime and our double prime can be hydrogen when both are NH3 is ammonia, and you get an amide. Again, our prime. And our double prime can be carbons or hydrogen or carbon groups. Now, once you get an amide, if you react it, and I'll use HCl, why? Because that's the acid in your stomach. And this is the reaction your stomach uses to break down protein. And when you take and react the amide, with acid and water, HCl is an acid, you get back the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that amide, but in the presence of acid, the amine you get is protonated, in other words, acts as a base, and you get the amine salt. Again, R prime and R double prime, one or both or none can be hydrogen. Now, you can also do base hydrolysis of an amide. If you take an amide, react it with sodium hydroxide, that's the base I'll use for this reaction, and water, you get back not the carboxylic acid you got up here, but the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that amide. Why? Because the carboxylic acid in the presence of base forms the carboxylate anion but you do get back the amine you could have used, you would have used to make that amide. Remember it again, R and R, R prime and R double prime can be hydrogen. Now I haven't covered this yet, but I will today. 
there's only one thing I'd like you to learn about. I'll cover more, but oh, this, this is all you have to learn about heterocyclic compounds. Those are rings with carbon and other atoms, such as oxygen and nitrogen. You should know heterocyclic compounds, cyclic ring, hetero more than just carbon, are rings with other carbon and other atoms, such as oxygen or nitrogen. Now, the only one I'm going to ask you to learn is this one, pyridine. Looks like benzene, except one of the carbons has been replaced by nitrogen. And this reacts like a tertiary mean and other things it's used for. It was used to make the quaternary ammonium salt in my mouthwash. The end. Any questions? All right, what I'd like to do next is finish up the means chapter, amides and heterocyclic, and maybe do a couple of practice problems first because yesterday I rushed through it, so I wanted to get through it. Then after that, we'll do the ester problem set and we'll go on to new stuff. So let's do a little... Let me get. All right, everybody see my whiteboard on the screen? Thank you. Then let's just practice a couple of reactions. Why don't we already go on through this? And why don't you try this one? Give the organic product or products your following reaction. Three points each. Well, I see one thumbs up already. Uh, more of them are coming up. All right, I think you're done. Let's take a look at this. What's different? And as always, and I do this anytime I look at an organic molecule, I look for what's different, what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon-carbon single bond. Should get to your attention like that. Hopefully that got your attention. And we have here oxygen hydroxyl group. And what do we have? Carboxylic acid. What's here? Ooh, nitrogen. With carbons, we have an amine. Now, I'm going to write it this way. Where R prime and R double prime can be hydrogen. In this case, one of them is. And what do you get? You get an amide. What's attached to the carbonyl carbon is still there. What's attached to nitrogen is still there. But now the nitrogen is bonded to the carbonyl carbon. And in this case, what's R? What's R prime? And one of these hydrogens is R double prime. And therefore, what's attached to the carbonyl carbon is there, nitrogen. And I have methyl as R prime and hydrogen. And I know there's four bonds to carbon. Oops, not that one. <laughs> now, 
Now, you could have also written it this way. And this indicates that's on this nitrogen. And that's how you do that reaction. Well, let's do the next one. If you have acid hydrolysis, remember HCl, hydrochloric acid, is an acid, SH+, plus, but a specific one. Why? Because that's in your stomach. You get back the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that amide, plus not the amine you would have used to make that, but the amine salt, because am amines are bases, and acids react with it very fast. And here's another one for you to try. Give the organic product or products or following reaction. Well, I see one thumbs up person. I see a bunch more. So I'm going to go ahead and do it. Well, how do you do this? Well, you look for what's different. Well, I got a benzene ring, but that won't react with HCl and water. But I have a carbonyl with the nitro and R groups. I have an amide. I'm reacting it with. HCl and water. And what you get back is the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that amide. Plus, in the presence of acid, you get the amine salt of the amine you would have used to make that amide. And here it is. So what's our benzene ring. What's our prime and our double prime? My two ethyl groups. Because in a bracket, and there are two of them on there. So what's my carboxylic acid? Benzoic acid. Don't forget the lines and double bonds in the ring. I'll mark it wrong if you do. And then my two R groups, our prime and our double prime, our ethyl and you can write it this way this is one way and another way let me show you get a little room here you could have also written this And you don't have to put on the charges, but I do. And now let's do one more. And that is Dr. White's getting ahead of himself. <laughs> I do that sometimes.
you take an amide reactor with base and water, base hydrolysis of an amide, you get back, because you're in base, the carboxylic acid, no, the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make the amide, but you do get back the mean you would have used to make that amide. And there you go. Have fun. What would be the organic product or products or following reaction? Oh, I see the thumbs are coming out, so I better get to work. All right, what do we have here? What's different? Ooh, oxygen, double bond to carbon, carbonyl with a nitrogen too, carbon's here and here and here. It's an amide. And when you react it with sodium hydroxide and water, you get back the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that amide. And remember, oops, I'm getting ahead of myself again. This is Make Mistakes Tuesday. I remember in all amides, our prime and our double prime can be hydrogen or alkyl groups or whatever. And you also get back here the amine you would have used to make that amide. If we come here, this is our, one of these I can call our prime, doesn't matter which you assign the other, our double prime. Therefore, I get this carboxylic acid. No, I get the carboxylate anion because I'm in base and there's four bonds to carbon plus what's the amine I get. It doesn't matter which side you put what. There are other ways of writing this. I could have swapped the methyl and ethyl group. And that's how you do it. And I thought that would be a nice little review to help you out because I rushed through things yesterday. Don't forget I mentioned yesterday, as of this point, other than one slight modification, I will not be teaching you any new, any more new general reactions. But we're going to take them out into the real world in the next chapters to see where they play a role in your daily life, the general reactions you learn. And it'll be fun. But then again, I'm an organic chemist. But before we do that, you people look like you could use a pick-me-up. So let's play that fun game. Circle and name the functional groups.
and I can say where in, and I can say a. B C And let's do a D. And there you go circle and name the functional group in each, two points each. Have fun. And when you're done, give me a thumbs up. And the thumbs are rolling in. Doesn't make sense. <laughs> it's the votes are rolling in. <laughs> All right, I think everybody's done. Let me get to work then. If we look at A, what's different? Look for what's not carbon, what's not hydrogen, what's not a carbon, carbon, single bond. Ooh, oxygen's here. And what do we have? An ester. And I should have gotten part of that oxygen. Next one, ooh, oxygen's too on a carbonyl, but we have this. And this is a carboxylate anion. And ooh, look at C, we've got a nitrogen, we got oxygen's here and here. What's this? We have this, our prime and our double prime can be either one or both, hydrogen, and this is an amine. Ooh, again, oxygens, we have this. And this is a carboxylic acid.
And finally, D. D, I think I threw in everything but the kitchen sink. Oh, look at this, and nitrogen. And I had to put the anion here. And that's a quaternary. ammonium salt. And here we have carbonyl oxygen, carbons here, carbons here. This is an ester. And finally, oh look, carbon with nitrogen, it's an amine. And that's how you play that fun game, circle and name the functional group, two points each. All right, let's get back to the chapter 11. All right, real quick, I'm going to be turning the switch. Will this be on the uh, test to the off position? There's another functional group that you make from uh, aniline called a diaz diazo group. That's this on a benzene ring, and you can have stuff on the benzene ring. Now, you can react the diazo group with a phenol or substitute a phenol. Notice I even have on there will not be on the test, and you form this molecule. And this are called azo dyes or synthetic dyes. And when you have different groups on the benzene rings, you have different colors, which is how chemists get the different colors to dye clothing the way it is. Now, in the old days, like long, long ago, you got dyes from plants, and this switch is still off. This complex structure is called indigo dye. It comes from the indigo plant, and it's very expensive to get. It's a very dark blue. And who could purchase that? The royalty back in the 16 or 15 or 1400s. And this was called royal blue or indigo dye. Now, switches off. Let me just cover real quick. Uh, there's something called the alkaloids. And alkaloids are nitrogen-containing compounds that are extracted, come from plants. And alkaloids can have major physical effects on your body. When I was in grad school, we had to give two seminars, one on a topic you just research and one on a research project you have to come up with. And I did mine on the uh, Boga alkaloids. And there's these tribes in Africa that use this. And this stuff is so powerful. When they take it, they must be on a heck of a buzz because they're able to stand in one place for two days without moving when they're hunting. <laughs> wow, that must be, that's really a strong physiological effect. But anyways, switches off. What you see on the sc your screen is morphine. And World War II, morphine was a very powerful painkiller used in the battlefields in World War II. And notice it has a lot of functionality. There are complex ring systems called bicycloidin. But here you can see it has a tertiary mean, a phenolic compound, ether, and a hydroxyl group, an alcohol, and double bond. Now, Interesting enough, if you take one of the hydroxyl groups from morphine and make it into a methyl ether here, isn't it amazing you understand what I'm talking about? This structure is codeine. 
and codeine is a very effective medicine, painkiller, and also it's good for coughs. When I was about seven and a half, eight, I came down with asthmatic bronchitis. And the whole summer I spent indoors because I was coughing my brains out. Uh, but anyways, my father being a pharmacist brought back a bottle of the best cough medicine around, a bottle being a quart. Uh, it was his pharmacy, why not? He'd get it by the gallon bottle. She inexpensively or not, I don't know how inexpensive, but, and it was called elixir turpent, elixir turpent hydrate with coating, which is essentially water, ethanol and coating. It was 80 proof ethanol or vodka with coating. And it stopped my cough. And one morning, my father, I'd take two tablespoons in the morning. It was good, like two shots. I'd feel good, it stopped my cough. I wasn't coughing anymore. And my father said, I should take that bottle back to the pharmacy. But I need it. It makes me feel good. He smiled. Yeah, I bet it does. I was going to school on a coating and an alcohol buzz. I did feel good. Now, if you take these two alcohols and morphine, and make them into esters with acetic acid, now we get something not that nice, and that's heroin. Now I'm gonna talk about some things that you shouldn't be doing because they're illegal, but this is organic chemistry, and this is heroin. Now, another molecule that's a alkaloid is cocaine. And here you have a tertiary mean, a complex ring system, Got an ester here, another ester here. And a very simple secondary amine called methamphetamine. And when it's a white crystal, and it's got the nickname crystal meth. And back when I, a number of years ago, uh, there's a great magazine put out by the American Chemical Society. It used to be weekly, now I think it's monthly. I dropped my membership. I couldn't see paying it because I could get the book read the magazine at the library. But they did a great article when crystal meth was quite new on it. And I still remember they said, you take this once and you can get addicted immediately. And a similar type compound is this drug that's ecstasy that's used, uh, used to be, I don't know now, it never was that one, in rave clubs. Now, there are places where you can find amides, silk is an amide, wool is an amide, your hair and skin are amides, and all proteins are amides. I'll come back to that later. Uh, I'll talk about polymers next chapter. All right, switches on for prior to the slide. Heterocyclic compounds, and let me go through the slide and we'll take our break. Uh, you don't have to know, but it's the largest class of organic compounds. You should know what is a heterocyclic compound. It's a compound that contains carbon and other atoms in a ring. And those other atoms, also known as heteroatom, are either oxygen and nitrogen. That's what you should know from this slide. And many of them are aromatic. Now, there's only one heterocyclic compound. I'd like you to know the name and structure. That's pyridine. Pyridine is an aromatic compound that's got a nitrogen instead of a carbon in a six-membered ring. And it's aromatic like benzene, except this stuff stinks. Think about putting a couple of dead fish in a plastic bag in the middle of summer out in your backyard and a month later coming back and smelling that bag. Pyridine smells worse, <laughs> but it's a good compound and it's used to make any, many things. All right, switches off. How many of you have heard folic acid is good for you, especially if you're pregnant or young? And also for us people, the rest of us. And notice this has, don't write the structure down, two carboxylic acids. I have an amide here, uh, an amine. And notice down here, I have a heterocyclic compound. How that helps us, I have no idea. But mother nature is the greatest of all synthetic organic chemist. To make that, she has to be. 
All right, let's take a break. Come back in five minutes. If I look at my clock, I went over a minute. Come back at 1.56 and we'll continue. See you in five.
let's get going. And what I'm going through real quick now, I just thought to give you a, it will never be on a test, but it's interesting. This is a heterocyclic called parole. You don't have to know it. It's a five member ring and the non-bonding electrons along with these two pair of double bond pi electrons, this is aromatic. If you stick a bunch of them together, you form this macro compound or big ring macrocyclic compound made up of parole rings. And this, when it has certain things inside and on the rings, we call it either heme, like in your hemoglobin, or chlorophyll. For heme, inside right here is an iron. Dr. White, we can't see your blood. Oh, no. Sorry about that. Thank you for letting me know. I forgot to ask the thumbs up people. Bad Dr. White. All right, instant replay. This is parole. Thank you, Matt. All right, I assume that was Matt. Thank you. All right, five member ring with a nitrogen, two bubble bond, pi electrons, and the two electrons from the nitrogen form an aromatic ring. Put it together, you form a porphyrins. In fact, that Michigan State not the group I was in, but one professor, doc, Dr. Legoff, very nice gentleman, very sharp person. He's His group did work in porphyrins. And those are macrocyclics, big rings made up of porphyrin. And here you see the basis for either hemoglobin or chlorophyll. And when you have an iron in here, that's what hemoglobin is. And this helps transport important gases in our body, like oxygen and carbon. There's, I have it right here, heme, and throw on some proteins and we call that hemoglobin. Now we have something called indols. That's this uh, heterocyclic and you find that in serotonin, important compound in your brain. And these are called purines, again, now, purines are the building block for some you might have heard of caffeine and something you might not have heard of theobromine, which is the major ingredient and flavor ingredient in cocoa, meaning chocolate. Now, here's caffeine. Don't write this down. This will never be on a test. And notice between the two carbonyls in red, I have a nitrogen with a methyl group. And as many of you might know, caffeine is very addictive. I remember when I gave up uh, tea, I was drinking a lot, which is high in caffeine. I could feel it. I was going through mild withdrawal symptoms. Well, if you look at theobromine, it's the identical structure as caffeine, except the nitrogen between the two carbonyls has a hydrogen. Well, for me, I can take or leave chocolate but if you've ever heard of people who are chocoholics, they can get addicted to this in their body the same way most of us get addicted to caffeine. And that's chapter, I've done it. Yay, we're done with this chapter. And guess what time it is? It's new chapter time, but not new functional groups. We're going into the real world now. Now, this next chapter deals with synthetic polymers, and I'll teach you what it is. I'm going to do in about 40, 45 minutes, teach you everything real quick about polymers. But I should tell you, to be honest, I could give a two-semester graduate-level PhD course on polymers. I'll probably even do four semesters easily. So I'm going to try and squeeze a lot in in a short amount of time, but I'm just going to cover the highlights. This will material I'm covering now will be on test four, test four, not test three, this uh, Thursday. But before I get into that, I better do the Esther's problem set, which I almost forgot to do.
all right, I better ask. Everybody see the carboxylic acid nester problem set? Thank you. All right. Again, on test three this Thursday, you'll need to know nomenclature and reactions. That's the bulk of the points. And how do you name a carboxylic acid? Find the longest chain, name it as an alkane, drop the E, add OIC in the word acid. And this would be butane butanoic acid. Now, the common name became the IUPAC name. This is benzoic acid. Now, the carbonyl carbon is number one. So if we look at D, we have how many carbons in the longest chain? Five, pentane, drop the E, add OIC in the word acid, pentanoic acid. Carbonyl carbon is one, therefore the methyl group is on four, four methyl pentanoic acid. Now, carboxylate anions, there's two, you name it like an ester, and this would be the cation, you name the element it comes from, sodium, three carbons, propane, drop the E, add OATE. Now, when R is benzene ring, like in G, you have to use 2A, and that is the still the cation is K plus potassium ion. So you put potassium in front, but this you have to say is benzoic acid, and you drop the IC and the o, uh, word acid and add ATE, and it's potassium benzoate. Now esters, you name the R prime on the oxygen in front as an alkyl group, then you can use, if it's not benzene, find the longest chain, name it as an alkane, drop the N at O-A-T-E, and this would be ethyl propanoate. And here, this would be nine carbons, octane, drop the E at O-A-T-E, and that would be octanoate, and on the R prime is an isopropyl group. Now, there are two common names I would ask you to know how to do. One is acetic acid, and the other is ethyl acetate. Here's acetic acid. Nobody calls it ethanoic acid. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. I think there's a frog in my throat, Ribbit. Test, test, ester, ketone. It's working again. All right. Now, how do you name, determine what to draw? Start at the right, move left, OIC acid, carboxylic acid. If it were an E, hexane, six carbons. On carbon two is an ethyl group. And I write my carboxylic acid on the right. Start, you can do it on the left, but I don't. And if we look at F, OAT ending, can be either a nester or carboxylate anion. You look in front, do you see an element's name? No, I see an alkyl group, so it's an ester. In front is the R prime, ethyl, and if we say OAT ending, replace with E, propane, three carbons. Now, G cross off, because Dr. White got too excited and forgot that I would promise I won't put an alkyl group on the R of an ester, so you'll never see anything like G. However, H, as I said, is a common name, one or two, you should know, and that's ethyl acetate, and that's that ester, which nobody calls by the IUPAC name, ethyl ethanoate. I have to think about it for a second because nobody calls it. Next, how do you know how to draw this? Sodium benzoate, OAT ending, ester or carboxyl slate anion, metal or elements name in the front. So it's benzoic acid, replace the H with O minus and A plus. Cross off J, I shouldn't have put it there. All right, if we look at A, aldehyde, I'm oxidizing it. 
remember O in a bracket oxidized, and you get a carboxylic acid. Then I have a bunch more. And if you look at D, did you see what I do there? I put in a big, scary R group. But if you know this is an aldehyde, the only thing that changes is hydrogen becomes hydroxyl. Everything else comes along for the ride. It's not big. It's not scary if you know what it is. Ooh, look at E. What's different? Carbon, carbon, magnesium, halide, a Grignard. And then we're reacting that with carbon dioxide, second step, acid and water. You get a carboxylic acid that's one carbon longer than the Grignard R group you started with. I start with two, that's my R, ethyl, and notice I get propanoic acid, three carbons. And that's how you do it. And ha, I did it again. Notice 4A, I have a big, scary R group, but it's a Grignard. And you add one more carbon with the carbonyl and hydrox group to the big, scary R group, which isn't that scary. Now, carboxylic acids are acids. You're reacted with a base. Notice, and I didn't put down here, M can be lithium, sodium, or potassium. You get the carboxylate anion. What's R here? Three carbons plus my carbonyl, O minus Na plus. You don't have to put the charges there. I always will. Now, remember when you do placement, it's important. And here I just changed the base and the R group. Now, number five is very important. And the fact that notice the question is, draw the condensed structure for not just the organic, but all products formed for this. What are we reacting? Acetic acid, which is found in vinegar with baking powder, sodium bicarbonate. You get back the carboxylic acid, the carboxylate anion, CO2, notice zero up tells you CO2 is a gas plus water. It doesn't matter which order you put them in. And what's our methyl? And you get this carboxylate anion, water, and CO2. And remember, this is a reaction Dr. White did with the rocket ship. And also similar to this, my father used with his tomato sauce. And here I just changed the R group. All right, 6A, I got carried away, crossed that off. Sorry about that, sports fans. And 6B2. All right, if we look at 6C, we have what? Look for what's different. What's not oxygen? What's not, what's not carbon? What's not hydrogen? Should get your attention like that. Carboxylic acid, carbon hydroxyl alcohol, acid catalyst, you get an ester. Remember the carbon with the hydroxyl group in R prime is the carbon with the oxygen in R prime and the ester. And here I just change R groups, same thing for E. Haven't done this in a while. Do you break carbon, carbon single bonds? No, so don't, I don't. And here, if we look at G, I have what? An ester reacting with base. I forgot to put the water in the original problem set, sorry. And you get back ester, saponification of an ester, base and water. And you get back the carbon carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester, <clears throat> plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And I changed. Here, the cation instead of Na. Oh, I made a mistake. Ooh, don't look, don't look, don't look. On H, that shouldn't be Na plus, that should be K plus. Oh, I'm gonna have to go home. Oh, wait, I am home. Sorry. And then if we look at 7A, what do we have that's different? Carbonyl, oxygen, oxygen here. Carbons on the oxygen, carbons on the carbonyl, ester, acid, and water. And you get back the carboxylic acid plus the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. In this case, what is that? 
Oh, I just remembered. I forgot a reaction and a general reaction. When I'm done here, I'll do that right after this problem set. And you get back the carboxylic acid and the alcohol you would have used to make that ester. And here's our, here's our prime. So I get this carboxylic acid and this ester. Notice the hydroxyl group is on the carbon that the oxygen and the ester was on. You put it elsewhere, I'll mark it wrong because it is. And the next couple are the same thing. And this is a general reaction I forgot to put in the review. One of my favorite, because it's so cool. If you take an ester and react it with not one, but two, and in the original problem, I forgot to put two because organic chemists at my level wouldn't even put the two, but for your help, I do. Two Grignard second step acid and water, and you get two products, these two alcohols, and here to the first one, you make not one, but two carbon-carbon single bonds, and the OR prime is kicked off as a second alcohol. And you generally, when you're doing this, you keep R prime small so you can distill it off. If you look at F, is that beautiful? You take this ester, react it with two of these Grignard, carbonyl carbon, what's attached to it, <clears throat> this ring and CH2 are still there. You make put on two ethyl groups from the Grignard alcohol, and the ethyl group from our prime becomes ethanol. Look at that fancy alcohol. Molecules like that make synthetic organic chemists very happy. And with that, I'm done with the Esther problem set. Any questions on any of that? Almost forgot to do it. I was so zeroed in on synthetic polymers. All right, let me close this. All right, thumbs up, people. Now do you see synthetic polymers? <clears throat> Ooh, it's time for Dr. White to be subtle. First of all, what is a polymer? By the way, the word poly, mer, means poly means many. Mer means one unit or units, many units. And it's this you should know. Again, this is for test four. What is a polymer? It's a macromolecule built by repeating linking units of smaller units, linking of smaller units called monomers, mono one mer unit. And I have to tell you something personal. Dr. White's a trained person. Uh, my father got me hooked when I was five. He used to take me down on Sunday mornings when he had a chance. We go to the south side of Chicago, the main rail yard, and that's when these monster steam engines would be coming in. And we'd spend about three or four hours standing at the fence outside where they had the turntable and did things with the engines, moved them around, just like that. Well, anyways, how many of you have ever been stuck at a railroad crossing with a monster long freight train? And you see for the next five, six minutes, what? The same type of boxcar over and over and over again. Well, polymers the same way, but not boxcars, grouping of atoms that are monomers connected over and over again. How many times? up to a million, a million and a half of those monomers connected together. I was just gonna do a knuckle coupler if you know your trains. By the way, I also, one of my hobbies is model railroading, has been for a long time. And I model, or I haven't played with them because I got hooked on another hobby, uh, RGB LEDs. But I, when I do play with mine, I have N gauge and also LGB, tiny and big. 
And one of my favorite memories is when I used to go to Amsterdam, I had the time, I'd spend an hour or two just sitting in Amsterdam Central, the central train station, watching trains come in and out. It was a fun afternoon for me. All right, so you should know polymers are macromolecules built by repetitive linking of smaller units called monomers. Now, when we talk about polymers, and by the way, switches on full, there are ways of classifying polymers. One is based on the chemistry. The other is based on a key physical property. Now, when we talk about chemistry, there are two types of polymers. One is addition polymer, the other is condensation polymers. And what are, and this is what you should know. Ah, I forgot that slide. All right, it's whiteboard time. Luckily, I know this because uh, I've worked in polymers many years. What, when we talk about chemistry, what's an addition polymer? It's a polymer made up of or made from, I could have used the fancy word synthesized from, made from only one type of monomer. It's the same monomer over and over again. And you should know examples of addition polymers in our daily life, at least one of them. And one of them is rubber tires or anything made of rubber is an addition. And there's a polymer called isobutylene, which is a molecule that looks like this. This you don't have to write down. And this is a polymer that Mother Nature does also use. That's, that's the monomer and it's connected over and over again, like a million times to make rubber used for rubber tires. Another one called polyethylene, you know it as saran or plastic wrap in the kitchen. Now there's another type of chemistry and that's called the condensation polymer. And a condensation polymer has two or more different types of monomers. that are used to make the, that are used So addition polymer has only one type of monomer. A condensation has two or more different types of monomers. And examples would be
any plastic uh, bottle. Example, my water bottle or yours or a pop bottle. Anything made of nylon. Say a nylon jacket like I have downstairs in my closet in my hallway where you enter my house which comes from companies. And those are examples of condensation polymers. Those are polymers that have two or more different types of monomers. And you should know that. Now, that is chemical property. The other type of way of classifying polymers is based on a key physical property of that polymer. And the two types are thermoplastic and thermoset. And hint, know that. And a thermoplastic polymer is a polymer once formed can be reheated to form a new shape. Example, my water bottle can be recycled, can be reheated. This can be melted and made into new bottles or new other things. An example, of those would be like a water bottle. Uh, things made of saran wrap. which is polyethylene. And there's no correlation between the chemical and physical properties. You can have something that's either addition or condensation polymer that can be thermoplastic. And then the other type of uh, physical property by how to characterize polymers is called the thermoset. And you should know a thermoset once formed, that polymer cannot be reheated to form a new shape. An example, the classic one, are rubber car tires. If you've ever seen in the news or in the uh, history books, where sometimes in certain countries under dire stress and almost revolution, you see some people block a road by putting tires, rubber tire, car tires, and lighting them on fire, and they burn. They don't melt because they're thermoset polymers. And phenolic resins, which are made to use things like your oven knobs, and also, guess what? If you don't have metal buttons, those are usually phenolic resins, and they don't uh, can't be reshaped, they just burn. And I worked in phenolic resins and urethanes also. Now, as I said, the switch is off now. Addition polymers are formed by what we call free radical polymerization. Again, I mentioned earlier, which you should know, addition polymers have the only one type of monomer reacting with itself. Now, I could do a whole graduate level course two semester one year on free radical polymerization. I won't, but I could. And what you have is what's called a radical initiator, which reacts with polymers that have a double bond. And they form the switches off now. This is a radical which I really haven't discussed in chemistry or anything. And this will react with more of the same monomer.
And this can keep on reacting and building these long, connecting like you see up here. And N can be on the order of a million to a half million. Small ones are a half million. It can even be 1.5 million. Those are big. Now, L and our polymer chemists use that. When L the switches off here, I'll just do a couple of them. When L is H, polyethylene, that's your saran wrap. When L is methyl, that's called polypropylene. How many of you ever bought a flash drive or something that comes in that card with the little plastic shell around it? And you've got to go to extreme lengths to try and get it open? Well, that's polyethylene. And then when L is a benzene ring, styrene, you polymerize it, you get polystyrene. And guess what? That's the material they make a foam out of for your white insulated cups and the cheap coolers. All right. Now, one thing I would like you to know is cross-linking. What is cross-linking? It's chemical bonds between the long polymer chains. And what it does is it gives the polymer better physical properties, such as making it stronger, more rigid. Now, sad story to tell you. How many of you have ever heard the name Goodyear? Have you? And where have you heard it? Goodyear tires. Guess what? There's never been a Goodyear part of Goodyear tires. Really? Well, the story is the original Goodyear, and I can't think of his first name right now, came up with a way of cross-linking a very important polymer, rubber. Before, and other people were working on it, but he was the first one to patent it and commercialize it. And before that, rubber was this gooey mess that was not that useful. Afterward, it's something solid you can make into things like uh, oh, here's a word I haven't used in a long time, collages. <laughs> When's the last time you heard that word? Or raincoats or car tires. What is this cross-linking? Uh, and if you have a polymer, like any of the ones I've talk, talked about, they're mainly long chains like this, strings. If you have a bunch of strings, you can pull it this way and strong, but if you pull it this way, it falls apart. Well, what cross-linking does is forms chemical bonds between the different strings of a polymer, and this is called cross-linking. And cross-linking provides a lot of extra strength. And the Goodyear, what did he find? You could put sulfur into rubber and it would cross-link under the right chemical conditions. We call that now vulcanization. How many of you have ever smelled burnt rubber? It stinks. Natural rubber doesn't stink when you burn it. What you're smelling is the sulfur here burning and sulfur stinks when you burn it real bad. And that's where you see the smell that sminky smoke when you burn rubber. And the sad story was Goodyear was an alcoholic. This is back in about 1805. And these two very astute businessmen came to him and said, we'll give you a lot of money if you sell your patent to us and also allow us to use your name because he was well known. They said, sure. And I don't know how much they gave him, but within a couple of years, unfortunately, he drank it all away. Things like that happen in life. Now, like I said, condensation polymers are made from two different uh, monomers. And usually what you have are called difunctional groups, like a diol, two alcohols, to react with a dicarboxylic acid to make a diester. And generally most of, not all, but most of the condensation polymers 
have ester linkage or amide linkage to make them. Urethane is an exception. Epoxy resins are another, and uh, formaldehyde uh, phenolic resins are another one. But switches off. Notice how here I can make an ester. I still have a carboxylic acid on this end and an alcohol here, and I can make more linkages, and that's a polyester, like my water bottle, and we talked about that earlier. Now, polyamides can be made by either a diamine plus a diacid or an acid chloride, like here, is like a carboxylic acid, but much more reactive, and it will form an amide. If you take, like I have here, a uh, paraphenylene diamine, and this is called terephthalochloride, you form a polyamide, this is a repeating unit, and you make a fiber out of it, and you make sheets of that fiber, and you pile them together, and we have what's known as Kevlar. And Kevlar is one of the important materials used to make bulletproof vests like used by our policemen. I don't know, do firemen ever have to wear bulletproof vests? Sometimes, all right, it matters what neighborhood you're going in, or do you have to, Matt, if you don't mind me asking you, sharing, uh, do you have to um, always wear it when you're going on a run? Sometimes, yes, not our town, only shootings. I guess it matters where you're going, unfortunate. But Kevlar is one material. The military also uses body armor, which uses ceramic plates, uh, along with Kevlar for higher, I guess I'm not a military expert. Now, polyurethane, we'll talk about this when we do the lab, is where you react to what's called an isocyanate, and that's this functional group, which I am not teaching you this semester, but you react it with an alcohol, and this is called the urethane. Oops, I'm missing something here. And the urethane looks like it's an ester, and it looks like it's an amide together. And this can be, if you have a diisocyanate and a polyol, a lot of them, you make different things. And what are uses of urethane? Well, flexible ones make the foam you're sitting on now if you're on a chair with a cushion or your car seat. Rigid urethane foam is used for insulation. Now, I'm gonna show off Give me one second, actually more than one second. I have a number of patents and urethane foams for certain things I invented. And one of the badges of honor that you have, if you're working in urethane foams is you make the floating cup. And urethane has a catalyst in it and it hardens in a polymer and a solid urethane foam. If you can pour it out of a cup and as soon as it hits the ground or the tabletop, it solidifies, you get the floating cup. And took me five tries, which was not that bad. And everybody see the floating cup here? This is a urethane foam. And I made this, like I said, you make it in this cup. I was using it to make uh, samples to test, but this is one of my pride and joys. Uh, and this is a solid urethane foam. When you put more blowing agent or more bubbles in here, it's a very good insulator. Hold on while I put it away in its position of honor. I'll be right back.
and that's a urethane foam. By the way, isocyanates are very dangerous. When R is smaller, which is for, for um, urethane foams like you just saw, R is a benzene ring and has another N double bond to C O group your uh, isocyanate. But when N is methyl, they're quite hazardous. They're used for certain other things, uh, make it. And one of the worst chemical incidents happened in Bhopal in uh, India a number of years ago, where this reacts very violently with water and gives a lot of, uh, heats up and vaporizes. That gets in your lungs, you're dead. And when that happened, I remember waking up early one morning before I was going to work at a company where I was working with urethanes and heard about Paul and they said isocyanate and there were already 3,000 people dead. I wondered what idiot got water in there and that was the reason why it blew up and caused all those deaths. Now there's phenolic or phenol formaldehyde resins, which my last patent, I worked in this industry and that's a polymer made by reacting phenol with formaldehyde and an aldol. And like I said, that's everything you want to know about polymers in less than an hour. And I could do a whole 32 week, two semester course on that, but you got a taste of it. Things you should know. What is a polymer? Polymer is a macromolecule made up of monomers repeating units. Next, the chemical uh, properties, way of uh, characterizing addition polymer, the same monomers use, same type over and over again. Condensation polymer, you have two or more different monomers used. And an addition polymer, example be car tire, or saran wrap. And for condensation polymer, guess what? My plastic water bottle. Now, there's also physical property. One is thermoplastic, and that means you can reheat it and reuse it. Water bottle is an example of that. And the other is thermoset. That urethane I showed you, there's no way you can reheat that and re uh, shape it. It's a thermal set. It's going to be like that way. If you notice, that's more than 10 years old, a lot more. And that's everything you want to know about polymers. And we're afraid to ask. If I look at the clock, I think this is a good time to take a five minute break. And we'll come back in five minutes. I'll see you at 2.45. And we'll continue on with a new chapter.
Oh, I haven't used this in a while. <laughs> it's time to get started again. All right. We're going to get into a new chapter. And let me just close the old one out. Remember, chapter 14 on uh, polymers is test four, not test three. Test four, not test three. And the new section we're going to talk about, which deals with fats and oils, I have to be honest with you, I worked in that industry for a number of years, a while back. And I'm going to introduce you to things that are not even in the book. Is that cool or is that cool? It's cool. But let's get started. All right, thumbs up, people. Do you see chapter 15 on your screen? Thank you. All right. Why isn't that going down? Hold on one sec. Let me do some couple things. All right, now it's working. Sometimes when I have too many windows open, things get messed up. All right, this new chapter talks about lipids and detergents, and we're gonna get into some neat things. Coming attraction, I will teach you how you get your hands clean with soap, plus other neat things you never thought were organic chemistry, and they are. Now, lipids are chemicals or constituents that are come from plants or animals, and they're characterized by their solubility properties. They're insoluble in water, but soluble in something I'll teach you about what it means, nonpolar organic solvents like ether or hexane, alkanes, cycloalkanes. So lipids are something that chemicals that come from plants and water, animals, that are not soluble in water, but are soluble in organic solvents, certain ones. Now, there are two types of lipids that you should know. First type is called saponifiable lipids, and they can be hydrolyzed under alkaline conditions to yield carboxylate anions of, well, I'll teach you later. That's caused me to jump. I don't know who that is. Two more rings. One more ring. No. Last ring, answer machine, pick it up, it did. All right, and what this really means is a saponifiable lipid base hydrolysis yields carboxylate anions, plus other things. Non-saponifiable, and the word saponifiable comes from saponification of an ester. Now, non-saponifiable, non meaning not, lipids do not undergo base hydrolysis, no reaction. So you have saponifiable lipids and non-saponifiable lipids. And you should know a non-saponifiable lipid is 
a compound from plants and, or animals that yield carboxylate anions when you're at with base and water. And a non-saponifiable lipid is a lipid that does not react with base and water, no reaction. Now let's talk about saponifiable lipids. And saponifiable lipids, I'm gonna spell it wrong, so I'm gonna cheat and look up here. You also know as fats and oils. And what's a fat and oil? Well, one way is a triester glycerol. And I'll show you that in a second. Other way is sometimes called triglycerides. And when I went to new doctor a number of years ago, unfortunately I had to retire, but I still go to that practice because other doctor I now go to is just as good as he is. And well, I had a checkup, he called me in and said, I got to talk to you. And we sat down and I liked him because he was very straight and honest. I like doctors like that. And I don't know with my PhD doctors think they should be very technical and honest with me, which I also like. And he said two things. You don't get your triglycerides and your blood pressure under, out of, under control. You're in the 90% uh, percentile group to be dead in five years. Boy, that kept my attention was more than five years ago. And what he meant by triglycerides was the fats and oils I was eating. Bring that down. And I have. Now, what is a fat? What is an oil? And a fat is a triglyceride that is a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. For those who are wondering what room temperature is, 25 degrees C, and I think that's 77 Fahrenheit. But you should know a fat is a triglyceride that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. In case you're wondering what a semi-solid is, if you've ever let butter out on a dish, for a while, you know how it gets soft and if you stick your finger in it, it goes in a easily, but it's still a solid. That's what we call a semi-solid. Now, what's an oil? An oil is a triglyceride that's liquid at room temperature. And that's an oil. And if you think about it, vegetable oil at room temperature, and you can go to a local supermarket if you don't buy this product and look at the shelf and you'll see, guess what? They're all liquid. If you're at 25 degrees C or warmer or thereabouts in that building. Now, a fat, how many of you have ever made bacon and you get the grease, which is another way of saying fat, in the pan, if you let it sit for a while after it cools down to 25 degrees, it's a solid. By the way, for those who don't know, uh, when you cook with either hamburgers or anything like that, where you get that grease or fat, don't throw that down your drain because it'll clog up your drain. What I do is let it cool a little and then pour it into a Ziploc bag, plastic bag, and then I put another one around that. That goes into my garbage can, which is better for my pipes in my house. So you should know triglyceride, a fat that's a, a fat is a triglyceride that's a solid or semi-solid at room temperature. An oil is a triglyceride that's a liquid at room temperature. Now, reaction of fat or oils with acid or base. Well, let's do some stuff on the whiteboard. First of all,
before I show you the structure of all fats and oils, if you work in fats and oils, and we call those chemists oil chemists, those that work with petroleum oil from the ground are called petroleum chemists. Those that work with fats and oils are called oil chemists. And I was an oil chemist for a number of years. Normally, a synthetic organic chemist will draw an ester this way. However, oil chemists, those who work in fats and oils, draw their ester this way, sort of backwards. Now, what's the structure of all fats and oils? It's this triglyceride or tri, remember that means three, ester. And you should know the switch is on. And here we have a fat or oil. If it's a liquid at room temperature, it's an oil. If it's a solid or semi-solid, it's a fat. But they all have this structure right here. And let's take a look at that structure. Notice right here, we have an ester. Carbons are prime or are Carbons, oxygen, carbonyl, R, ester. And right here, we have an ester. And right here, this right here, is the third ester. So there's one, two, three esters in a fat and oil. And the difference between all Fats and oils are what are our prime and our double prime are. And that's the difference. But the next time you see vegetable oil, what you're seeing is that triester, triglyceride in there, and that's the molecule. Now, let's look at the following reactions you should know. I'm going to write it backwards because that's how oil chemists do it. Hopefully for Thursday, you know, if I take acid and water with an ester, I'll get back the alcohol plus the carboxylic acid I would have used to make that ester. I'm just putting the R and R prime in different location. So if I have a triglyceride, a fat or oil, and react it with acid and water, this first ester, I'll get this alcohol and this carboxylic acid. The second ester right here in the middle, I'll get this alcohol, but these two carbons are connected together. Do you break carbon-carbon single bonds? No. So I will get this oops, extra. I'll get this alcohol, plus from this part, I'll get this carboxylic acid. And finally, from the last ester here, I'll get this alcohol, plus this carboxylic acid. And this acid hydrolysis right here, this reaction is very important. I don't know if I told you, but when I was 
taking notes as a student in the left margin. If it was important, I'd put a couple of stars. If it was real important, I'd put a couple of stars and IMP and a couple of explanation points and an arrow. I'd know better know that because this is how your body breaks down fats and oils in your stomach. Acid hydrolysis of an ester. And the alcohols you get are connect together. And this has a name, which I taught you earlier. Glycerin. And these are carboxylic acids. And we call them not fatty carboxylic acids. That takes a lot of effort to say. So the carboxylic acids from acid hydrolysis of an ester, triglyceride, are called fatty acids. And I work for a company that made fatty acids and glycerin. And that reaction you're seeing, or similar one, we did to the tune of, depending on how good business was, two to three million pounds a week on the south side of Chicago. Now, this is acid hydrolysis. Let me give myself more room. If I have an ester and I'll write it backwards and react it, and I'll just use sodium hydroxide and water. Saponification of an ester, you get back the alcohol you would have used to make that ester, plus the carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester. So if I take a triglyceride, three esters, each one reacts like if it's alone. And if I take ester number one, I'll get this alcohol plus this carboxylate anion. If I do ester number two, I'll get this alcohol plus this carboxylate anion of the carboxylic acid I would have used to make that ester. And finally, ester number three, I'll get this alcohol plus this carboxylate anion. And these types of carboxylate anions from fatty acids, we have a name for that, and that's soap. And the original soap was made by reacting sodium hydroxide, the old name is lye, and with animal fat in water. And you get glycerin and this, when you cool down the water, is a white solid. And that's how you make regular bar soap. Now, that carboxylic acids that you get when you do acid hydrolysis of an ester of a triglyceride are called fatty acids instead of fatty carboxylic acids. And they're naturally occurring carboxylic acids and they're never branched. They're always a straight chain, even number of carbons. I'll never ask you what is a fatty acid and they're long. They're usually 12 to 26 standard are 18, 16, and 14 are the main ones. And we call those fatty acids. Now there's two types of fatty acid. One is, and by the way, switches on
the first type of fatty acid or one you should know is a saturated fatty acid. Oh, I know what saturated means. Remember saturated hydrocarbons, hydrocarbons with only carbon-carbon single bonds. Uh-oh, I use, having worked in the industry, FA means fatty acid, I'm sorry. I just noticed that <laughs> you do shorthand. I was good about quaternary ammonium salts. I'll try and stay good with fatty acids. But anyway, fatty acids, saturated fatty acids, you know, are fatty acids with carbon with a carbon chain, which all carbon carbon bonds are single bonds. If you put down in which all bonds are single bonds, I'll mark that wrong because the carbonyl carbon is not. There's a common name. I will only ask you to learn one saturated fatty acid. And here's the board, I'll let you see. And that's stearic acid. Now, stearic acid has the following structure. And since I'm not going to waste your time or mine writing out 16 CH2s, I'm going to use the parenthesis or bracket, CH2, close bracket, subscript 16 to say there's 16. And this is stearic acid. It's a white solid at room temperature. Uh, it's harmless. How do I know that? Because it's used in certain products. And I work for a company that made stearic acid. And I know the products because we sell for these companies. You should know on a test. I asked, draw the structure of stearic acid. There it is. You should know how to do that. Now, do I have time? Oh, I do have time. How many of you have ever heard of a company? It's now a division of another company called Benny Smith. Anybody know about Benny Smith? They're known by another name, Crayola Crayon. And if you look at the older box of Crayola Crayon, you'll see at the bottom, Benny Smith. And the company I work for, Unichemical Chemicals, made stearic acid that we sold to Benny Smith. And half the weight of a Crayola Crayon is stearic acid. The other is paraffin wax, a hydrocarbon. And then they put in some uh, pigment to give it its different colors. Now, when I was lab manager there at that company, got a call from the president of the company in the United States said, you got to be on a plane tomorrow morning to go to Vinnie Smith because they're having a problem. They want us to solve it. And I said, all right. And I took a plane to uh, Philadelphia and then we drove from no Pittsburgh and we drove to a distant suburb of Pittsburgh. I forgot the name to the headquarters of Vinnie Smith. And they played this typical game a lot of companies do. You got a problem, you blame all your suppliers independently and say, you're causing a problem, solve it. And it turns out I can't tell you how it was solved because then I'll have to shoot you. No, I don't know. It's a trade secret. But the problem was they're coming out with a new four new colors of Crayola Crayon. And after sitting in the box for about a week or two, just the very tip, the pigment would migrate away and it would be white. Can you see a little kid opening up his brand new crayon box crayons, looking for these new colors and seeing the tip white? He'd go to his mother upset and an upset mother would call Benny Smith. So I had to help, but I did go see there. They had a plant next door and I got to see them make Crayola crayons, it's awesome. It was faster than lightning how they were pop, pumping them out. And I helped them solve the problem I can't tell what it is, but it did. And in their atrium, they had the winners from last year of all the contests in the United States, kindergarten through uh, senior year high school of art contests. And it was phenomenal. And they all used Crayola crayons at that time. Now also 50% of the weight of a candle is stearic acid. And by the way, if you ever wondered, is stearic acid hazardous to you? How many of you have ever heard about the colorful ending when a child or a dog eats a crayons? I'll let you figure out what I mean by the colorful ending. It's safe, other than the choking hazard. 
supply. Anyways, also 50% of a candle is stearic acid, the higher quality. And the company I worked for, Unichema, that made fatty acids, started about 1800 in the Netherlands making stearic and oleic acid from animal fat to make candles. And I worked, I would go to that research and plant, and I have some candles that they're that were handed out to key people when they had their 150th, I think it was the anniversary. And I have a nice collection of hand dipped candles that I got in the Netherlands that I will never burn. They're so beautiful. All right, now, if you have saturated fatty acids, you can have a mono unsaturated fatty acid. Mono means one. Sat unsaturated means it has at least one carbon-carbon double bond present in the chain. And Mother Nature never did treble bonds as something organic chemist. The one monounsaturated fatty acid you should know is oleic acid. And the structure of oleic acid is this. And like stearic acid, it also has 18 carbons. And it's a carboxylic acid, but at C9, you have a double bond. And this can be cis or trans. And if you think about it, where does this come from? It comes from the R group and the fat or oil. When they talk about cis or trans fats or oil, they're talking about the R group and the R, the double bond, the R group of the fat or oil. I'll talk a little more about that. If not today, then next, uh, next day or two. You should know if I ask on a test, draw the structure of oleic acid, that's it. Now, both oleic acid and stearic acid are used in many things in our daily life. I know I worked for a company that made both. And I actually came up with, and they're still selling it, two high purity uh, oleic acid products that they still sell for cosmetic industry. Now, how do you name an ester? You drop the IC in the word acid and add ATE. And if you have stearic acid, esters of stearic acid are called stearates. Esters of oleic acid are called oleates. And if you look at some of your personal care products, like your skin lotions and all that, you see the word stearate, oleate, and I'll also talk about palmitate. Those come from fats and oils. Now, it turns out you can make amines and quaternary amines from uh, fatty acids which means your fabric softener, it's time for Dr. Wright to ruin something in your life, not really. Your fabric softener, a lot of molecules in your shampoos and other thing comes from fats and oils. So you should know the structure of oleic acid. Oop, I didn't write it there. Uh-oh, sorry. Give me one second. I got to shut my word down and reboot it.
All right, sorry about that. I have so many things running on this PC, my tablet, uh, Zoom, Word, and sometimes I don't know what happens. You gotta, it locks up like that. If anybody knows what's happening, let me know and send me an email or talk to me about it. All right, let's get back. Now, switches off for this. We have what's called polyunsaturated acids, fatty acids, and they have more than one, two or more carbon-carbon double bonds that I won't ask you ever on a test. Now, you can have double bonds in the R group of a fat or oil, and let me just write it this way. And just like you saw in either one or more of these, if it's unsaturated, our group, which would make an unsaturated fatty acid, that double bond can be cis, where the hydrogens are on the same side as a plane, or they can be trans. And as you probably know, medical science has found out, and I don't know why, it's not my area of expertise, but trans fats, when the double bond is trans, is unhealthier, more unhealthier for you than cis. And it must be important enough, or people think it is, but some big companies like McDonald's and Walmart have had their suppliers, like in McDonald's, their oil or fat they use for French fries to be cis fats, which costs extra money. All right. The switch is pa uh, partially on for this slide. You should know beef fat, and I'm going to, uh, beef fat is tallow. And I work for a company that we'd buy a couple million pounds a week of tallow. And that comes from beef fat, which we got from renders that bought theirs from uh, people who um, process beef, what's that called? Uh, meat pro, uh, packers, and BFT stands for bleachable fancy tallow that you don't have to know. Now you should know pig's fat is not called that, it's called yellow or white grease, not lard like it's in the book that's for cooking. So you should know pig's fat is yellow grease or white grease. And the difference is the color and you pay a little more, but yellow and white grease are about usually three or four cents a pound, two or three cents a pound cheaper than tallow beef fat. And if you're buying 100 and 250 million pounds a year, two or three cents is a lot of money. And whenever our uh, purchasing agent could get pig's fat, tallow, grease, yellow grease or white grease, we use that, but most of the time we got tallow. And there are other oils, coconut oil, soybean oil, I won't ask you, corn oil, and olive oil. But there's an interesting oil, vegetable oil, called rapeseed oil. This won't be on the test, but interesting story you don't know about. If you go into most supermarkets here in the United States, like in Chicagoland, you're not, hold on, I got itch in the eye. You're not going to find rapeseed oil. Now, rapeseed oil comes from the plant called the rapeseed, or the rapeseed, which comes from the rapeseed plant 
I'm not a person who knows that much about what's plant science called, whatever. But anyways, and where did they make a grow a lot of the rapeseed plants in Canada? And because of that, they make a lot of rapeseed oil. It's much cheaper, or I should say less expensive, lower cost than say corn oil or other vegetable oil. And in most of the world in, hold on, really got an itch. I think I got it. Uh, most of the world uh, in the poor economic countries, they use rapeseed oil to cook with. But when they tried to introduce it in the United States, the American housewives said, yeah, rapeseed, yeah, I don't want it. And they couldn't sell it. So someone very smart up in Canada in the marketing group for the consortium of rapeseed oil producers came up with a great idea. Well, this comes from Canada and it's an oil. Why don't we call it canola oil? And it is. And if you go to any supermarket, you can find it's lower cost somewhat canola oil, which everywhere else in the world is called rapeseed oil. That will never be on the test, but it's interesting. And you should know from this beef fat is tallow, pig's fat is either yellow grease or white grease. Now, both of these are very important chemicals that are used to make fatty acids that are used to make many, many things in our daily life. It's so important that contracts or things like fabric softener and other things are based on the price of tallow or white grease or yellow grease found in an amazing place. Where? The Wall Street Journal. Do you know where to look? Every Friday, they have certain commodities and tallow and white grease and yellow grease are listed there. It's also in the Chemical Marketing Reporter, which comes out, I think, twice or three times a week. I used to get it. All right, switches off. Here, in, we don't use IUPAC names for fatty acids, they're common ones. And the one I asked you to learn was stearic acid. Now C16 is called palmitic acid and oleic is one double bond, 18 carbons. Linoleic is two double bonds and linolenic is three double bonds. Now here on this chart, which I got from a book, they say they're cis, no, they can be trans too. Now, real quick, If you look on your screen, you'll see some certain animal fats. Here are the saturated fatty acids that come from the actual fat, the carboxylic acid. And you notice they're very high in saturated fats, which are worse than unsaturated fats for your health. And if you look at vegetable oil, look at olive oil, that's almost 90% unsaturated fats, which come produced on saturated fatty acids. And that's why it's healthier for you. But as all things, as my doctor reminds me, in moderation, you shouldn't just <laughs> load up on the vegetable oils and say, oh, olive oil is safer. No, it's still also something you should be careful of. Now, there's a reaction I like to talk about that's similar to acid hydrolysis of an ester. And this is called uh, hydrolysis of an ester, or as we call it, splitting an ester. Now, when you take an ester, and I'll write it backwards like a oil chemist would, and add acid and water, you get the alcohol plus the carboxylic acids, nothing new. You would have used to make that. And what's this H plus? It's a catalyst. It makes the reaction go quicker. If you didn't have it there, you could sit around for years and it might not do that. How else can you make a reaction go quicker? 
you increase the reaction temperature. You run it at higher temperature. So oil chemists found, well before I ever joined this eons ago, if you use steam and react it with a ester, fats and oils, and what's steam? Hot water. Very hot. If it's high pressure, dangerously hot, you can get you can die from it if you're not careful. And it does the same thing as acid hydrolysis. And the company I worked for, this is how we made our fatty acids and glycerin. And you should know this. In fact, I haven't done it for a while. So why don't you try and write the four products you would get from the reaction of steam with that triglyceride? Have fun. Look right above for help. Remember, you have three esters. I'll help you out. Ester one, ester two, ester three. Now we're getting into some fun organic chemistry. Not to say the other stuff wasn't, but now you're on my home court now. I see one thumbs up, and I think I'm going to see two. I see two. And then there was three. I'll give you a few more seconds to try finishing up. And I see another one. All right, let's get going. Now, if we look at this, what are we doing? We're acting steam, and here we have esters. So here's my general reaction. Ester number one, what's R? CH2, and I'll form this alcohol, and my carboxylic acid will be this. Ester number two, Here's my R group and right up here, and I'll form this alcohol, and I'll get this carboxylic acid, and notice my R group is, I'm calling it right now, R prime. And the last ester, here's my R group, and my form this alcohol, and I'll get glycerin, which is what this is. And my fourth product will be this fatty acid. And this should be one prime, this should be two. And that's what you get. And a company I work for, we did about two to three million pounds a week of that reaction. And I was the lab manager there. 
And I also managed a quality control lab for the plant, which was an interesting experience I hope I never have again. It's not a fun job when you're a QC manager in charge of a QC department, because they always, the only time you get noticed is when something goes wrong. All right. Now, let me talk about something that I decided to do. I know this industry, and instead of doing R and all that, how can I give you that real world experience? I came up with an idea how to do a general, <clears throat> general but very specific way of drawing fats and oils from beef fat, tallow, and pig's fat, yellow grease, and white grease. Essentially, they're interchangeable, not identical, but pretty much so. So what I came up with was the following. What I did was you have your triglyceride. And if you look at beef fat and uh, tallow, yellow grease, white grease, it's about 50% stearic acid and about 50% oleic. Well, I've got three R groups. How can I make it 50% when I have three? There's no way. So I said, well, let's do it this way. Two of them will be one, R sub S, sterile, and one will be R sub O. And this is what I came up with. Now, what do I mean by R sub S? Well, let's do this first. Everybody see the joke? S-O-S. -S. You don't know what that means. It's Morse code for save our ship. Help. But anyways, that's my joke. If I were to take acid and water, remember we have our ester and fats and oil chemists write it backwards and you'll get an alcohol plus the carboxylic acid you would have used to make that ester. So if I do ester one, I'll get this alcohol plus a shortened version of our steric acid. And if I do the second ester, the way I have my pseudo fat or oil from or actually be a fat from, this is either the representation for tallow or yellow grease. Or white grease, not named after me. It's the color, it's a lighter color where yellow grease has a slight yellow tinge to it. And if you take any of them reacted with acid and water, the second ester, you will get this alcohol. I keep on wanting to put it at two there. I always do that. Plus oleic acid, which using my shorthand is this. And finally, the last alcohol or last ester You'll get this, so you get glycerin overall. And you get here, stearic acid. Now, since I only asked for give the organic product or products, you don't have to write this again, because essentially what you get is glycerin, stearic acid, and oleic acid. Now, let me show you what my shorthand is. Steric acid.
if on a test I ask you to draw the structure, don't use the shorthand, this. Remember, this is R sub S. You should use, guess what? The proper way of drawing it out. Now for oleic acid, which you'd get from that acid hydrolysis, you get R sub O, but the actual structure, if I ask you to draw the structure of oleic acid, don't use the shorthand, but And let me get this out of our way. And you get this. And when we say R sub S, we're really talking about this as R sub S. And for R sub O, we're really talking about this. Organic chemists are lazy. So R sub O has a double bond in it. It's unsaturated R sub S which stands for sterile group, has a, a unsaturated chain of those carbons. And that's why I used it here. And it's a shorthand we use, and it comes from this. And those are what's on the, in the fat that we split. Now I taught you about this and you know something, if I look at the clock, oh no, we're just about out of time today. Boy, time flies when you're having fun with fats and oils and Dr. White and other things too. Listen carefully, don't forget, tomorrow I will go through the amines and amides problem set. Thursday will be test three. Tomorrow, my office hour for that night only, this semester, will start at 8 p.m. I sent out an email to that effect. Don't forget the lab you did on Monday is due tomorrow. Uh, oh, that reminds me. I have to apologize. I realized I got a little behind in grading labs by Sunday. I will be totally caught up grading all labs. Make sure you get them in. And with that, I'm going to let you out a whole 30 seconds early. Shh, don't tell the dean about that. With that, have a great rest of the day. Gain gesund, be healthy. Goodbye.